I'm relatively new to professional development. One of the things that I struggled with in breaking into the tech scene was figuring out how to create projects that would keep me engaged and that I could use and use freely, not worried about any type of repercussions uh, due to licensing and other issues. I got a job. I was an advocate. Part of my job was building projects. So I told myself I was going to do my best to build projects that would bring about change, that would create opportunities for other people, especially people that looked like me and had to deal with the same struggles that people that looked like me had to deal with. There was just one problem. I didn't really know how to go about doing that. I put my thinking cap on and from there, I decided I was gonna look for government data. And I was surprised because the data was available and I could use it. In most cases, if you live in a major or minor city in the United States, your city collects a plethora of open data available to you under a Creative Commons or public domain license. And it can be from anything from street repairs to police records. Upon further investigation, I found that there was even information at the state and federal level available to me. And of course, anywhere there were discrepancies with local city or federal data, you had journalist outlets and colleges and universities that were picking up the slack, hoping to make those changes. Even though the data was available, it wasn't really fun, it wasn't the easiest to work with, and it definitely came with its own mess of problems. In fact, in order to be able to be downloaded by as many people as possible and available to as many people in the public domain, what most agencies often did were store tens to hundreds of thousands of records in a series of CSV or JSON files, often with coding that wasn't really easy to follow. And that's a problem because unreadable data ultimately leaves with people feeling like they can't make a change. And that's not the goal here. The goal is to provide people with the resources that they need to understand what's happening in their area to give them an opportunity to bring that information to politicians, to people who can make a change and enact policies based on that data. However, from what I could tell, the data either wasn't being used or was being obscured in the most extreme ways. So I sought out to figure out how I could make sense of some of these data sets. And one of the first tools that I reached for in this process was Pandas. Pandas is a great tool that gives you the ability to read flat files and display them in a visual manner directly in your wrapper. You can choose to output this data into a variety of formats, and it also gives you the ability to work with the data as needed and store it in scripts and even compare multiple pieces of data both visually as well as with some Boolean type matching. By using Pandas, you're able to look at a data set, look at a CSV file, and figure out what data has in common with other data in the set. You even had the ability to merge multiple data sets fixing some of those coding issues where instead of a full description of what happened, or a full description of a field, you only got a letter, now you were able to merge those two together and actually create a complete picture. However, pandas can only get you so far. In fact, there are a few issues where pandas kind of becomes a liability. If you're working with extremely large data sets, uh, ones that take up a lot of storage space, also, I mentioned visualizing multiple segments together. It's good to do, but eventually some of those lines of code can get 
rather ugly. In fact, sometimes I wind up breaking my data sets altogether just trying to compare two pieces of information that seem like they should be really easy to compare. But I wasn't giving up yet, and from there I decided to lean on some of the tools that I had at my disposal. And one of those tools was Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch gives you the ability to search for the things that you're looking for. In fact, search is prioritized, so you have wonderful options available to you like powerful visualization and machine learning capabilities all while still keeping that data in a document-based storage system that makes it extremely readable and easy to work with both inside and outside of the Elasticsearch baked in visualization tools. It also made searching through extremely large data sets a breeze. I could go on and on about how we could log into a Kibana instance and visualize, and we might do a little bit of that. Of course, we wanna visualize the data in a, a powerful way. And in fact, visualization is something that was important to me, but I still wanted that pandas-like capability still leveraging the power of something like Elasticsearch. And at the intersection of pandas and Elasticsearch is Elant. Elant, which I'm probably not pronouncing correctly, uh, mostly because it is an Afrikaans word for an animal that's similar to an elk in, as we would look at it. Um, but Elant is a way that you can data frame Elasticsearch data. You can also use it to interact with Pandas data frames and tie those connections together. By starting with the data frame from Pandas, you can actually make the mutations that you need prior to uploading that data into Elasticsearch. Now from there, you're able to not only take data frame data and insert it into Elasticsearch, but you're able to use Elant to provide the same type of segmentation and discovery that you could do in Pandas. In fact, most of the functionality that you get natively in Pandas, you also have in Elant. You just have to think about it in terms of everything that's Pandas like will use the same function name and anything specific to Elant will have the ES moniker in front of it. I wanted to show you how easy it is to start with Pandas and migrate your way up to Elant. So let's take a look at this Police Call Records challenge that we had. So we're here in our San Diego Police Call Data Project, and I wanted to show you, here we actually have CSV files for some of the data that they're reporting on. And as it looks like this, there's not really much that we can tell. They also give us the Police Call Types, which is another data set that we're able to use to make sure that we have a good reference here and that kind of tells you what we're looking at so we can see we have the csv file all this information is up here so we can kind of know what each row is telling us but again looking at it this way we don't get a good visualization of this information and this is where using something like pandas can come in handy so the only problem with using pandas is we have seven years worth of data, which is about 3.5 million records. Um, even uploading this to Elasticsearch takes a few minutes. So I've gone ahead and already done that, but I want to show you what that process looks like. We have a file here called add to elastic, which we create a connection um, using Elasticsearch's client connection here and you can see that it's just a simple from Elasticsearch, import Elasticsearch um, and provide the hosts. From here, the first thing that we do is those call types that I showed you, that, that dictionary file of, hey, these numbers mean this happened. We're going to make that a pandas data frame. And that gives us the ability to read this information and use it 
to our advantage. So let's go down here and we have this pandas data frame that we make uh, where we're actually reading a file path and that's all this iterator is. So basically this click script takes a list of file paths and it iterates through it and for each file path it processes it, it reads the CSV and it turns it into a pandas data frame. We continue down this path and we convert our floats to ints on that beat. We do something similar for priority. Um, originally, priority had a few values that don't fit the current model. In some cases where they would use a P to signify it was the same priority, but somehow a higher priority, which doesn't really make sense to me. I just kind of removed that P value and kept the integer. So if it said it was a priority 2P, it wound up just being a priority 2. And do a couple of things here where we make a merge and we merge on that call type data set. So that's that first call type that we had, that first data frame that we had at the beginning. And we add that field of call type or sorry, of description to the call type. So what we should see now is instead of just seeing, you know, call type, let's see, what's a good one? Okay, so the call type is an AU1 or the call type is a, a 23 or 230, 152. We'll actually see what that means. And I'll show you that in just a little bit. So finally, now that we've made all of these changes into how we create these calls, what we're going to do is we're now going to use the Elant pandas to Elant method. And what this does is this says, hey, let's take our data frame that we made. That's this data frame here. Let's load it into our Elasticsearch client. We're gonna give it this index, and the reason we're using the stem of that file path is so that all these stems are the same, except for the year, which gives us the ability to then create an index pattern and treat all of those years as a singular index so that when we're actually visualizing this data, all of the data will look as if it's coming from one location instead of seven. And furthermore, we'll say if this exists, let's go ahead and replace it. Here is where we get a little interesting with type overrides. What we're doing with ES type overrides is just stating that we want these fields to be registered as this type of data. But as you can see, we have date time as date, the primary direct, the address direction primary being a keyword the beat as we mentioned before we don't want that to be a number we want that to be a keyword um, so that it isn't treated like a number as well as the priority and the day of the week all right so we're going to save that and i'm not going to upload all of them mostly because i think that would uh, take a little bit of time there we go and we're going to then run this add to elastic function and we're not going to run all of them but i do want to show at least one running so we're going to just do um, assets pd calls let's just do the latest one 2021 it's going to have the least amount of data in it we hit okay let's try that again it's loading it's loading the data and it's taking the 30 or 365,000 records from just 2021 and, and adding it to Elasticsearch. And again, like I said, this takes a few seconds. I mean, obviously it's having to run our functions on each of those rows to sanitize the data, get it, prepared to be uploaded, um, running that call type, and then from there, uploading it into the system. Okay, now that this is done, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start a Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so let's open up our browser and we will create a new Jupyter Notebook. I'm gonna delete these old ones here and we're gonna create a new one. Here we go.
All right, so the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're connected to that Elasticsearch instance. And we do that by going from our connection And I might be in the wrong space for that. Yep, let's. There we go. Then from there, what we're going to do is we're going to imp we're going to import Elon. And we're just going to check our client first by doing client info just to show that we're connected all right we're connected also we're gonna get these warnings because I'm working in a test environment with no security I don't recommend you do this in production but you can import warnings and we'll do warnings just to yeah remove those flags that tends to happen uh, in demos a lot but now what we can do is we can actually create an Elant data frame, which is Elant.data frame. What we want is we want that ES client. Remember, anything that's talking to the elastic side will have ES underscore in front of it. And we have ES index pattern, and we're gonna have that equal PD. Calls for service. And just so that we can include all of the data sets, we're gonna use an asterisk there. And as you see, we get records for 3,869,775 rows. Another pandas method that we would try is, well, another pandas technique would be just segmenting the data based on a particular piece. So before we go further, so I don't have to keep calling this. We're gonna make this a variable called df. There we go. If we say df.info, we can actually see, hey, you know, you have all of these rows. It's part of an Elant data frame. And we're looking at our memory usage, which is 64 bytes, which is incredibly small uh, for 3.8 million rows uh, or 3.8 million documents. And then our storage is about 400 megs. So from there, now let's do a DF and we're gonna segment by beat. Uh, one of my favorite beats that I like to use is beat 523. I don't have a reason. I just tend to use beat 523 a lot. Um, so we can see beat 523, all of these are beat 523. One thing I wanna highlight here, when we did that uh, ES type overrides. If you notice here, you actually have some integers. You have address number primary, which is an integer, and then you have the date time, which is the date time that we called. But when you look at call, you know, the call type, it's an object. All of the other t keywords are shown as objects. Um, and that's similar to how what pandas would read. Any type, anytime it's a string like object, um, it has the data type of object. So we can see something very similar here. Now, if you remember in that CSV file, which I can actually we'll zoom out and show you here, the CSV file here, we had the call types and we just had these codes. In the system, we actually have what these codes describe disturbing the piece. And we did that through using that dictionary file that we had that we uploaded and that gave us the ability to do that and of course with this being pandas we can even do comparing on multiple groups such as we want everything in beat 523 but we also want the description to equal disturbing piece and now, when we check here, everything will have disturbing the piece. And we can see all of those different things. So as you can see here, we're able to work with this data in Elasticsearch as if it were a pandas data frame. 
In fact, we can even copy and paste some of the existing code. I can't use disturbing the piece because we don't have that built in, but let's go back. Well, we can just do it down here. Let's go ahead and import pandas. And underneath there, we'll say, we'll call this one PDF, and not to be confused with the file type, but this will be pandas read CSV, and we'll do assets. We'll load, we're not gonna load all the data in, but we'll load the latest year like we did this last time. And we wanna parse dates, and that's gonna be, Oh, whoops. It's supposed to be a list. Also, just to double check, let's see what this is. Yep, date underscore time. So we load that in. And let's do this exact same function. Uh, we know the call type is a 415, so what we'll do is we'll change the description and we'll just do the call type. 415 and we want to call on our new data frame and we can do that. We should get all the call types being 415, all the beats 523. So it's it's the same type of functionality for each one, except for we now have the ability to actually run queries and have all of our data in Elasticsearch, which also gives us the added benefit of being able to connect to an Elasticsearch cluster or, or Kibana, our visualization tool, and we can do mapping to have these layers built out. So what I'm gonna do is, I've already uploaded the GeoJSON file for it, but what we can actually do is we can go add that GeoJSON field. It's gonna take a second there. We're gonna add a layer and we're gonna join the beat to our police data calls index pattern, which I made prior to this, but to that beat as well. We're gonna save that. And we're gonna zoom in on our map here. And what we should see, if we look at the last eight years of data, it's gonna take a second, and we could have done the last year of data, probably would've been a little bit faster. But we start zooming in and we now have a map of our area in San Diego, which is something that we couldn't do originally given just the CSV files. And as I mentioned before, we can even Go on beat 523. Let's zoom in. It's there, it's a little hard to see, but we can zoom in. And we're down to the street level of where these calls originated from. But as I mentioned before, using pandas, we were able to actually write functions that could translate one form of data into a different type of data prior to uploading it to Elasticsearch, which made visualizing that data very easy. In fact, in the last year, I've actually worked on a few other projects, including uh, San Diego Police Stop Racial Identification and Profiling Reports, as well as the Washington Post Deaths from Police Shootings Dashboard. And I have a GitHub repos for all of this information, so head over to my GitHub. So in conclusion, I want you to know that you will find some data. That data will most likely not be ready for you, but you can use tools like Pandas and in some cases even Elant and Elasticsearch to make that data ready. And when you're done, you can use Search from Elant to surface that data and still make it presentable so that hopefully one day you can help make a difference as well. I've been Jay Miller. Thank you so much for attending my talk. And I hope that I've encouraged you to go out there and in the famous words of Senator John Lewis, stir up some good trouble.